Okay, do you guys want to see proof? Like, actual proof that magic exists. Okay? I'm not messing with you, okay? I can't explain this. You can't explain this. Science can't explain this. Nobody can explain this. Are you ready? Okay. I present to you a picture of Robin. Okay, that's not where the magic comes from. I know, like, immediately you'd be like, Oh my god, what wizardry! But no, 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 no. It gets crazier. It's not just Robin. It's also Nami. Wait, there's more. It's also Boa. Look at that! Look at that! Look at that! Look at that! Look at it! D do you know how this works? I don't know how this works! Okay? I'm scared of this thing! Alright? Seriously! Uh, who should we go with, though? Should we go with Nami for this video? Robin for this video? Like, I feel like I'm editing this in real time. <laughs> you know, like, whatever. I don't know. It's so weird. Uh, I guess I'll just go with Robin, because it's Robin. Okay. So, um, this was sent to me by a fan. I did a fan mail stream a couple days ago. It's also where I got this awesome rug. I'll just talk about that very briefly, because it's the very noticeable thing in the background. So, uh, a fan of mine, Lloyd, sent me this custom rug that uh, I think he got from Bartolomeo, because Bartolomeo was selling a lot of the One Piece merchandise, right? So, I got this awesome rug, and it's very handy because it covered up the bottomless hole. So I don't have to worry about falling into the bottomless hole, you know, that Big Mom fell into, that Kaido fell into, so now I have that covering it up. So we're good on that. Thank you, Lloyd. And uh, this amazing magical portrait back here was sent to me by Kenneth. So thank you to Kenneth, and he also sent me a really nice letter. I read the whole letter on the live stream, but just let me cover the uh, pertinent part for today's video. Who in the One Piece world is considered the strongest woman without a devil fruit? So I read that on stream, and I thought about it for a little while, and, uh, you know, I actually thought that was a little bit of a head-scratcher. That was an interesting little uh, thought experiment to think about, because, like, immediately, and even Kenneth puts in his letter, you know, when I think of, you know, some of the strongest women in One Piece, you think of Big Mom, you think of smoothie you think of like robin obviously right however they all have devil fruits so i don't know i i might make this like a four-part series you know strongest men and women that do have devil fruits and then strongest men and women that don't have devil fruits uh not really sure so let me know about that but i did make a list here and uh, there's actually quite a few of them i was actually really pleasantly surprised by this of how many women in the one piece world are very powerful that do not have devil fruit uh, abilities okay that's really good. This isn't really going to be like a top 10, top 20 list because actually how many I have written down here? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. It's like 18 characters I ended up writing down. Now, of course, you know, the strongest woman in all of One Piece I think is pretty obvious. It's uh, Big Mom, okay? Unless like, you know, Eam turns out to be a woman or some like other character, you know, we haven't met yet really or hasn't been revealed yet. Uh, so far, Big Mom, right? Uh, followed closely, I would think, by uh, Boa Hancock. You know, and then maybe, like, Smoothie, and then you can just, like, work down the list from there. You know, it also reminds me of that interview that uh, Oda did when Film Red was coming out, when people were talking about, like, oh, what's the plot of Film Red going to be? And uh, Oda talked about how he was tired of drawing, like, really strong, legendary old dudes. And he's like, because we had that with, like, Film Z, and then Film Gold, and then Stampede. And then Oda was just like, can I draw, like, a pretty woman <laughs> for this movie, please? And so that's where it kind of... Uta came from. So, uh, Uta, unfortunately, is not on this list either because she has a devil fruit power, actually a really strong one. Uh, but like I said, other video. So, uh, in no particular order, let's just go down this list. First, I feel like we should start with Nami, right? Because, you know, she's a member of the Straw Hats, you know, one of the two women as a member of the Straw Hats. Um, and, you know, unlike Robin, she does not have a devil fruit power. Now, many people would, I think, consider Nami to be one of the weaker members of the Straw Hat crew. Um, I've always referred to her as, erroneously, as a glass cannon. I, I always viewed Nami as somebody that actually can dish out a lot of, you know, pain and punishment with her climb attack, especially now that it's fused with Zeus. But I always felt like, oh, if she, you know, takes any kind of serious damage, she's going to go down. And um, if you actually examine the story, that's really not the case. Um, and I'm not even talking about Wano when she fought against Ulti and got really banged up in that fight. Even if you go back to Alabasta when she fought against Miss Doublefinger, I really forgot all the damage that Nami incurred in that fight. Um, 
Um, and, and some of it's very brutal. Like, at one point, Miss Doublefinger sends, like, a spike, like, straight through Nami's ankle. And she still fights after that. Then at another point, she takes the climb attack. And remember, this wasn't, like, the perfect climb attack or the Zeus, you know, version or whatever. This was, like, first-generation climb attack, which was a little bit more than a party favor that Usopp invented. And that's all she has to fight with against Miss Doublefinger. There was a moment where Miss Doublefinger turns her hair into just, like, this morning star of just spikes. Nami has to lift up her other foot, the one that wasn't, you know, I th actually, I think it might have been the one that was stabbed through the ankle, and then she blocks the attack. It's like her foot just run through with spikes, and then, like, kind of holds her back with the climb attack. And then she's able to use the tornado tempo to like wrap up Miss Doublefinger and then blast her away. You know, I think she hits like one of the like one of the uh, buildings in Alubarna and then she gets knocked out and that's how Nami won that fight. But like, holy crap, she took a lot of damage from that fight alone. So yeah, not really glass cannony. Um, you know, she does have the lowest bounty out of the Straw Hats if you exclude Chopper's kind of like joke bounty. But even so, right now we are at Nami having 366 million berries of a bounty, which is insane to where we're at right now where that's higher than Luffy's post and his lobby bounty. Okay, so the Straw Hats are all, at this point, extraordinarily powerful. Alright, so that's Nami. She has her climb attack, now fused with Zeus. I'm feeling like this is gonna be the last version of the climb attack she's going to have. Uh, like the perfect, perfecter version of the climb attack, as it were. It was already really powerful when Usopp kind of infused uh, the technology of the Boeing Archipelago of, like, the Pop Greens, like the plant so it can like grow, uh, but also the magic technology of Weatheria inside of the Climatact. But now you also have Zeus, and so the Climatact is essentially sentient. Um, there could even be a situation where, let's say, Nami gets separated from the Climatact, like an enemy like knocks it out of her hand and it falls down like a precipice or like a crevasse or something. Um, is it crevice or crevasse? Crevasse? Crevice? Are they two separate things? I don't know. Anyway, now that Zeus is inside of the Climatact, you know, you could have Nami on the ground and like the enemy is like, haha! I've knocked away your weapon and then Nami's like you sure about that and then she just does this and then the climb attack comes back and like Zeus is like I'm coming Nami BAM just like knocks the guy in the head or something it's like you know she has like a nano machine that she can like control with her like thoughts now like that's that's pretty cool so we'll, we'll see what Nami really has we haven't really seen her fight at all during uh, Egghead yet so I uh, haven't really seen the full scope of what she could really accomplish um, after training with Zeus and the new climb attack a little bit right so that's Nami Nami, of course. So moving on now to Vivi. Vivi Nefeltari, who is the princess of the Alabasta Kingdom. Uh, there's some stuff that happened in recent chapters with Vivi, but I'm not going to spoil it, so just as like a general discussion. So Vivi, uh, remember, was a member of Baroque Works. She was a frontier agent. She was Miss Wednesday. So she can fight. She can hold her own. She was able to uh, achieve the rank of frontier agent in Baroque Works, and she held that rank for a fairly, I think it was like at least a couple of years that uh, Vivi was undercover in uh, Baroque works, okay? So she can fight. Now, her main method of fighting, it's kind of like combination of uh, duck back fighting. <laughs> I was going to say horseback fighting, but she has a duck, so she fights on the back of Karu, who is a supersonic duck that can move really fast. Um, she uses a type of, like, whip-like weapon, except it's not really a whip. They're more of, like, these chains that she keeps uh, on her fingers called uh, peacock slashers. So they're, like, a bunch of, like, chains and, like, razor-edged, like, you know, razor blades essentially, on top of, like, her finger, and then she kind of, like, spins them around like this, and she, like, slices up people. So it's, it's a slashing weapon, a very, honestly, a, a weapon that looks like it would require a fair amount of dexterity and training to use. Um, not the kind of weapon that just anybody can pick up, like, a club or something and just hit somebody with. This is a weapon that requires a certain amount of finesse in order to use, okay? So she definitely trained with that for a while. I could see Vivi training with her peacock slashers, having, like, some dummies, and then she's, like, you know, swinging them around and, like, slicing the dummies in half or something. Very unique kind of weapon for her. Nobody else in One Piece, nobody else in really in all of anime I've really seen has a weapon quite like that. I'm sure you can find somebody else uh, in all of fiction that has used a weapon similar to that, but, um, you know, not, not really so much from uh, other characters. So I think Vivi has definitely been training in the last two years. I don't think she's really quite on the level of, like, other pirates because obviously that's not, you know, Vivi's job. Her job is to not be a pirate. Her job, as she decided to on 
on, you know, stay in Alubarna is to be a princess, to be a member of royalty and help out her people. Okay, not the kind of pompous royalty where I'm just going to sit around all day. You know, Vivi's not like a Marie Antoinette kind of character. Actually, we have a Marie Antoinette kind of allegory in One Piece, and she's not that great. But uh, anyway, no, Vivi is definitely someone that's there for her people, okay? And I'm sure whenever she did have some free time, uh, she practiced with her peacock slashers. She kept up with that and everything like that. Um, but she's just not, I, I don't really think she has hockey. If she does have hockey, maybe she has observation, which would be very useful in aiding her in, like, you know, taking care of her country and her people. Uh, maybe in a similar way that, like, Otohime, where Otohime had this very high spec observation hockey that was specifically, like, she was basically an empath. Uh, Otohime was. So she can, like, sense the emotions of others. So I could see maybe Vivi unlocking an ability such as that. Um, it's been a discussion for a while, like, what would happen if Vivi did eat a devil fruit? Uh, she would be very, very powerful. Uh, the Yuki Yuki no Mi is still floating around somewhere, Monet's devil fruit. So I don't know if Oda's ever going to circle back to that. But if uh, Vivi ever consumed a devil fruit, it would be cool to have her, you know, have the, the Yuki Yuki no Mi, which is a Logia, which is, which is fairly strong there. You know, no, obviously, like, if she wanted to join up with the Straw Hats again, like, Luffy would accept her. I mean, she's a essentially a member. She just decided to leave to be with her people, but she could rejoin the crew essentially whenever. Uh, that would be a really cool moment. I think they are going to be reunited at some point. So, uh, she's definitely strong, but her duties as being a princess probably, you know, uh, override any sort of, like, training, serious training she's been doing. So, I don't think she's any weaker than she was during the Alabasta arc. She might be a, f a little bit stronger, uh, but nothing crazy powerful, okay? It's not like Vivi's gonna take out her peacock slashers, infuse it with armament and hockey conquerors, you know, that, that would be cool, but I, I don't think that. So the next person on the list I put down was Okiku. Uh, Okiku, uh, Kiku Nojo of the Lingering Snow, uh, one of the members of the Nine Red Scabbards. Uh, she took a lot of damage uh, during Wano, okay? So there was the moment where, like, her first big, big moment in the story, uh, I mean, there was the moment at the prison when she revealed herself, you know, she put the mask on and everything like that, um, but the, the first really big moment was when she fought against Kondro uh, after Kondro revealed himself to be a traitor and we find out a little bit about the backstory about how Kondro, because you know Kiku and Izo were a little younger than the rest of the Scabbards you know, at the time when they joined Odin to travel around Wano and everything like that and become his uh, his retainers okay, so uh, when it came to like uh, Kiku and Izo they were very much taught and educated by Odin and you know Ashura Doji and Kinemon and Denjiro and Kondro, okay, and so so there was some flashbacks there where Kondro was like educating uh, I, uh, Izo and uh, Okiku and teaching them about stuff and everything like that. And so Kiku really had sort of like, you know, kind of viewed Kondro as sort of like an older brother sort of figure. So it made it all the more painful when she was the one that decided like, okay, I'm going to fight Kondro here, okay, outside of Kaido's Manor when they landed on the, uh, the wintry side of Onigashima. And so they clash. And it seems like she wins. You know, Kondro's on the ground, and he's bleeding out. Kinemon kind of takes off his hat and just kind of throws it down. And they walk into the castle. And I'll be honest with you... I honestly think you could have just ended that fight right there. <laughs> like, considering what we saw with Kondro later, he comes back disguised as Odin, he blows up Ashura Doji, he summons the, uh, the Kanzenbo, which is this giant, ghostly visage that's essentially just the condensed hatred and rage of the Kurozumi clan, made manifest in this, uh, flaming ghost that just ignites anything on fire. Um, you, did you really need the Kanzenbo? Um, I guess it was the impetus for what, like, uh, detonated the explosives, uh, which resulted in, like, the, the, the downfall of Big Mom and everything. Uh, I suppose that was the case, but the whole castle was on fire anyway, uh, because of Orochi lighting on fire, so I, I feel like you could have just had Kondro be defeated by Kiku there. So then they go and fight against Kaido, uh, Kiku loses an arm. Uh, there was a really good moment there where after she did lose the arm and it fell down into the festival hall when Zoro noticed it, that was when he was like, okay, this is a serious battle. They're literally fighting. They, they're, they're literally putting their lives on the line up there, all of the scabbards, even though they know they're sort of outclassed. I mean, like... <laughs> Like, they had to fight against Kaido. They understood that. But also, you have to know that, like, each of the scabbards, when they're up there on the roof and they're facing down a giant, 
actual literal dragon that can breathe fire and crap. They had to think about this for a moment, like, we're all going to die here. But that's okay, even if we do, because it's at least we're fighting for Odin's memory at the end of the day. Okay, we're gonna fight to win, but like... He's a damn dragon, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, um, yeah, Kiku loses an arm, and then there's the situation later after the battle. Uh, well, I guess, you know, she participates there to cut down Orochi's head, just like all the other scabbards do. And then there's the situation with Kaido fighting against Kinemon, and Kiku's also there. Um, that's a big debate whether or not, like, Kiku and Kinemon should have gotten out of that situation alive. Uh, you know, honestly, and I even mentioned this in the live stream with the fan mail. It's like, I'm... I'm a little bit okay with Kinemon surviving that more than I would be, like, Pound surviving his encounter with uh, Oven. You know, I'm just like, okay, it's a little bit of a deus ex machina, but, like, the way that Kinemon survived that, it, it kind of made sense. Um, I'm glad that Kiku made it out alive, though. Izo, Izo, unfortunately, passed away. And it's like, you really got to feel for her at this point. You really do. Where she was flung into the future with the rest of the scabbards. She doesn't know if the rest of them are alive. She doesn't know if her brother's alive, okay? She has to cut down the man who she viewed as, like, her uh, like her big brother, Kondro. And then after that, she gets reunited with her long-lost brother. And because even before they got sent into the future, she had no idea where Izo was, you know what I mean? And so Izo's back in Wano, and they reunite, and it's like, okay, um, I had to cut down Kondro, but my brother's back and then Izo dies at the end of the battle and it's like my god but she's there with her friends the rest of the scabbards and Momonosuke and Shinobu and everybody and they are going to help uh you know Momo rebuild all of Wano so the the future is looking bright but um, a lot of pain and suffering from from Kiku's side during that battle um, next up, I wrote Sadie, uh, Sadie Chan from Impel Down. Sadie is one of the characters that does not have a devil fruit, and we don't really know if her ability has anything to do with hockey or not, but she does have some kind of extra ability. So Sadie is the, you know, BDSM queen of, uh, Impel Down, uh, to use a term, and, uh, she uses her whip to manipulate the demon guards, okay, the jailer beasts that are awakened zone users. She seems to have complete and utter domination as it were, over them, where she can, like, whip them with her whip, and uh, he's like, hey, get up and chase after the pirates, and they're like, okay, and then they get moving. Uh, from what we found out about zones in the last few chapters involving Vegapunk, uh, it's really interesting that um, there's different types of zone awakenings, even, we're not even talking about mythical zones or ancient zones at this point, just normal zones have, like, a wild kind of awakening and a true kind of awakening. The true awakenings would have been, like, Rob Lucci's Leopard Zone and Kaku's Giraffe Zone, where they awaken and they get that like flame pattern uh, with their hair and they also have complete awareness and control of their actions while a lot of other zones as Vegapunk stated uh, when you awaken you just become this mindless beast you get a buff when it comes to strength and uh, endurance and your healing factor goes up but you really lose all sense of like speech and language and intelligence kind of goes there you become a lot more primal like an animal okay uh, and you're just you know maybe so maybe that's the way that Sadie can kind of manipulate them because they're more like animals she kind of like tames them like animals in like a circus or something okay so it's like their intelligence goes down so they don't really have their own level of sentience anymore or autonomy and so uh, Sadie kind of takes advantage of that uh, but she was pretty strong uh, Ivankov fought against her and defeated her pretty handily but I think she's more her strength really comes less from her own physical abilities and more from the power of her being able to control the demon guards and make them kind of do whatever like if Sadie some and all, uh, I guess, five of the demon guards now, because we have Mino Chihuahua in the mix, uh, if she summoned all five demon guards together to fight alongside her in one, like, choreographed battle, she'd be fairly difficult to deal with, okay? Um, you know, with all five of them, or all, I guess, all six of them together, so, that's Sadie. Uh, next up, we have Momosagi. Do you know who Momosagi is? Momosagi, also known as Gion, is a member of the Marines. She's actually a Vice Admiral, and she started as a fan creation. There was a SBS question years ago where, um, I guess this was before Fujitora and Green Bull were properly introduced as, like, Purple Tiger and Green Bull. So, um, the fans were kind of, like, theorizing, like, who are the new Admirals going to be? Uh, what are their, like, the colors they represent and everything? And one person suggested... 
uh, pink rabbits, uh, Momosagi, and then uh, Chaton, who was brown pig. And Oda actually made those characters canon uh, from the SBS, and we actually see them in the story, not just in an SBS. They show up during the Reverie arc. They're there. Um, we see Gion and Chaton. And, uh, or I guess Momosagi and Chaton as their code names. I forget what Chaton's real name is. We, we do know it. It was revealed. Uh, but anyway, uh, this is what she looks like. Uh, she's pretty cool. Kind of resembles Robin mixed with, like, Boa a little bit there. Uh, she's got this really badass spider tattoo on her leg. And, uh, we, we don't know anything else about her. Uh, she also appears in Film Gold, though, so that's that's a thing. Uh, you know, she is a vice admiral, though, so she would know hockey. She would know armament hockey and observation, at least the, uh, you know, the basics of that. Uh, she might very well have a devil fruit, and at this point, I have to bring up that there's some women on this list that we just don't know a lot about, so uh, Gion might, in fact, have a devil fruit we just don't know yet. Uh, as with the next character I'm going to discuss, another vice admiral in the Marines, and this is the one we actually just got introduced to during the Egghead arc, uh, Dahl. So, had to include Doll on this. Doll's only had a few appearances, but I think she's already going to be a fan favorite. Uh, she seems like a pretty, like, like I would say no-nonsense kind of badass, but also she does care about her own, like, you know, she's not, like, like very cruel to her own um, subordinates or anything like that. But, like, when Garp called her up and was just like, Hey, Doll, I'm going to show up and we're going to go to Hachinosu and bust some pirate heads. You want to join in? And Doll is like, No, uh, can, you can't just do that. Did you get approval from higher up? And Garp's like... <laughs> No, why would I do that? And Doll's like, you can't know. We're going to Egghead now. We were ordered to head out to Egghead, you know, for this fleet uh, by Kizaru. So Doll is definitely very loyal to the Marines. She knows she has a job to do, and she does it fairly well. Uh, once again, we don't know a lot about her. She might very well have a Devil Fruit, too. So I guess, you know, if she's revealed to have a Devil Fruit, then this point is moot. Uh, but I had to bring up Doll. Okay, apologies, but I'm actually filming this part at the end of the video uh, because there's actually somebody I skipped on the list. And uh, it's a pretty noticeable character in the One Piece world if I would have skipped this person that, like, like she's on the thumbnail, for God's sake. I almost skipped Tashigi. So I apologize for all the Tashigi fans out there, seriously. All right, yes, Tashigi is definitely one of the strongest women in the entire story, okay? So uh, she has been training pretty much her entire life. We see her as a child, like, reading a book on swords. So she was interested in, like, stabbing abby swords for like you know ever since she was a little kid and so she's been training with that she's been rising through the ranks in the marines so when she was fighting against monet uh i remember that it was like you know she had armament at that point but it wasn't like on the level of zoro or anybody and she wasn't like nearly as powerful so she's probably improved with that quite a bit you know and unlike like vivi who you know had to like you know take a backseat to training more to like, you know, other duties that she has. Um, Tashiki is a Marine captain. Okay. She has to be strong and she has to get stronger and stronger. Okay. And more and more powerful and more skilled with her blade, obviously more skilled with observation and armament hockey. If she's a swordswoman, then armament hockey most definitely. And so I feel like at this point in the story, it's been a while since we've seen her fight. I don't think she, uh, got a higher rank or anything like that. I don't think she was promoted to Commodore or anything, although she easily could have been. I think we we saw her recently and it was still listed as like Captain Tashigi, but still, I think she's a lot stronger than she was at Punk Hazard. And um, I feel like, yeah, Zoro kind of walked in and just like eliminated Monet with like one attack. Um, Tashigi definitely was having a hard time with Monet there. Um, could she have beaten Monet if the battle drawed on a little bit? Because Tashigi's also very, very clever. She could have figured out a way to like, you know, because also, you know, Smoker is a Logia, Monet was a Logia. Maybe she would have had some skill there to be like, hey, I train with a Logia user like every single day. I know the kind of tricks you pull. Um, but Monet had a really powerful Logia to snow and like freeze and everything like that. So it, it might have been a little bit tough for her to win. Uh, and I think Zoro even kind of let her like have her fight. And it was clear that she maybe was getting beaten down and she couldn't beat Monet. And so Zoro stepped in. Um, but I feel like, you know, after that fight, I think that's like she's learned some stuff from that and be like, OK, where am I lacking? How can I get a little bit stronger here? Um, and it also comes back to the whole dynamic because Tashigi and Kuina look very similar and the whole premise of, um, you know, Kuina's backstory, one of the things that resulted in her death, uh, really the main thing that resulted in her death is because she felt just because she was a woman, she was therefore going to be uh, unable to become like as strong as a man. OK, and so that was one of the reasons she became like extremely depressed. OK, and so. If Kuina is truly still dead, if she's not going to show up later as, like, a member of the Revolutionary Army or anything, uh, this is an interesting, um, 
viewpoint for Zoro, where Zoro is witnessing Tashigi fight against Monet, and he's like, I'm not going to get involved here because he's remembering Kuina, and he's just like, you know what, I want to see, you know, Tashigi, I'm not going to step in and, like, you know, fight, you know what I mean, I'm not just, not just going to walk in and be like, alright, Tashigi, well, okay, you did your best, but now, you know, he, he waited until Tashigi was very clearly, like, kind of beaten down, and it's like, okay, um, you might need some help here, and then Zoro took down Monet. But, you know, I, I think Tashigi's definitely gotten stronger, and uh, she's collected a bunch of really rare swords. That's the other thing. She uses uh, Shigure, which is her main weapon. Uh, but she has a bunch of really other valuable Wazamono-grade blades. I'm still kind of upset she didn't show up in Wano, like, at all. Um, but, you know, we could still do a thing where maybe she shows up at, uh, maybe not Wano, but she so shows up with the Straw Hats later and sees Enma, and she freaks out over Enma and stuff like that. Uh, she might have had a, a really cool sword that may she, she might be not uses on her own because she's so used to Shigure, but she might have like an Owazumono that she found somewhere, you know, maybe something. So I'm uh, really looking forward to seeing some more stuff with uh, Tashigi. Uh, also, before I forget, uh, wasn't really going to say much about her because we don't know much, but I feel like in a video talking about strong women in One Piece, I feel like I would be remiss to not mention Porcus de Rouge, who was so badass, she was able to keep a baby ace inside of her womb for 20 months. Yeah. <laughs> so I feel like kind of relevant to bring her up in this video. So uh, there's Tashigi and Porcus de Rouge. All right, now back to the rest of it. Um, also, since we're just going along with that little, uh, you know, the new introductions with G14, uh, Hibari. So Hibari is a commander in the Marines uh, that really kind of respects Kobe. Maybe she has a crush on him. I don't know. She's like, we got to go save Kobe, Senpai, please. Um, once again, uh, I, you know what? Honestly, I view Hibari as like a Kobeni character where, you know, in her first introduction, Kobeni, was like this really scared and just like I don't know what to do guys oh my god we're gonna die here you know but then in her next appearance in the next arc she's like a total badass like she does have the skills to pay the bills I view Hibari as that as well where Hibari was very upset because Kobe had been kidnapped by Blackbeard and he might be dead right now or being tortured and Hibari just like Helmeppo was very upset like we gotta go save him right and so they're heading out now with Garb and I think when they show up at Hachinosu like I don't think Hibari is gonna be like some kind of like insane insanely powerful character or anything, but I think she can hold her own against most pirates. All right, she is a commander in the Marines. Uh, you know, she seems kind of short, but, you know, don't let the height fool, fool you. I think she can, like, I don't know, pull out a dagger or something and just, like, slice up a bunch of pirates at once, do some really cool acrobatics. I don't know. We'll see what Hibari's capable of, but yeah. Um... Next up is Isuka. Uh, do you know who Isuka is? Isuka is a character from the Ace Light novel. She was an ensign, but she was an ensign during the time that Ace was like heading out to sea to become a pirate, which was three years before Luffy, which was five years before the current storyline. Uh, Isuka was kind of like Luffy's smoker, but for Ace. Okay, that was like Ace's big marine rival. Okay, although not in the same dynamic. Um, it, it was kind of the the impression you sort of got from it was Ace viewed her more as like a friend and a colleague because Ace kind of felt like, you know, she really can't, like, she's not strong enough to actually defeat me, so it was more of like a, a friendship kind of thing that Ace viewed it as. Meanwhile, Isuka was like, you know, Porcus Firefist Ace, I'm going to bring you in! And Ace is like, oh, hey, Isuka, how you doing? Hey, we're just about to have dinner, wanna come on? You know, so it's that was, that was the kind of dynamic there. Um, maybe there was a little bit of a romance there, I don't really know. But anyway, she she was an ensign five years ago, so she's probably been promoted. She might be the same rank as Kobe. She might be a captain. She might even be a Commodore or in the Admiral class by now. I mean, five years. Look at Kobe. Kobe went from a lowly cabin boy, you know, swabbing the deck to a Marine captain in the span of two years. All right. And, uh, you know, Isuka already had, you know, uh, an advantage because she was already an ensign five years ago. She was already an officer. Ensign is the lowest um, officer rank in the Marines. So she she already had a head start on Kobe by being an ensign five years ago. She could be like, you know, honestly, if you were going to say that uh, Isuka was a rear admiral or a vice admiral right now, I would buy it. It's been a long time, okay? And uh, also the fact that Ace has died, I would really like to see Isuka in the story. Um, there's been plenty of characters like uh, the, uh, the, um, 
sorry, uh, the Spade Pirates, Ace's crew, that showed up during the flashback at Wano. Like, we saw Mass Deuce, like, right here in the anime. So these characters are canon, I would assume. Isuka's out there somewhere. It would be cool if the Straw Hats could run into her, and Isuka can talk about Ace, and after Ace's death, she was just as distraught as everybody else was, and she trained, and she got stronger, and she's like a Vice Admiral right now. Pretty cool. Uh, she did not have a Devil Fruit. She fought with, like, a rapier. Uh, nailing Isuka was her epithet, so she would, like, use a really cool rapier, really fancy rapier, and, like, you know, stab people with it. So, there you go. That was uh, Isuka. Next up is Shocky. Gotta talk about Shocky. So, Shocky, as we found out recently, uh, you know, up until this point, we kind of had an implication that she was really powerful. She was Rayleigh's wife. Also, she uh, apparently was chased around by Garp a lot back in the day. Uh, chased around as a pirate. Not, not was like Garp was like, you know, infatuated with her. Although, you know, maybe, who knows. Anyway, back in the day, uh, you know, she was on a pirate ship. We assumed it was the Rocks crew, which... Could still technically be the case, uh, but we find out later, like recently, that she was actually a former empress of Amazon Lily uh, before Boa Hancock was, a couple of generations ago. So she wasn't the empress right before Boa, but I think she was the empress before that empress. So she was two generations back, and then I think Gloriosa, who was um, Granny Neon, was the empress before Shaki. Uh, because Shaki is like in her uh, late 60s, I think, and Neon, I don't really know if we have Neon's age... She might be in her 80s, so the timeline kind of kind of fits up there. Uh, so there's like maybe some other Empress of Amazon Lily that would be like in her uh, maybe late 40s, 50s right now. Boa just I think is like around just 30 years old. So yeah, that that could work out there. But you know, obviously, not just being the Empress of Amazon Lily, being the Empress also means that you are the pirate captain of the Kuja Pirates. Okay, and it was also mentioned that one of the reasons Boa became a warlord so quickly was because of the exploits of. Four former empresses, because they knew how terrifying the Kuja were, as soon as Boa became the new, uh, captain of the crew and the new empress, they pretty much, like, immediately, like, made her uh, a warlord, or asked her, you know, to join the warlords, okay? So, it could be the former empress right before Boa, obviously, but it also might have, like, a lot to do with Shaki. Shaki, during the time of Garp, might have gotten to a lot of craziness, and, uh, you know, defeated a lot of marines, you know, and just, like, it might be a lot of blood on Shaki's hands right now, um, and it's, like, because of her exploits, with when Boa became an empress, they're like, okay, we're not dealing with this Kuja crap again, you know what I mean? Just like, you know, invite her to be a warlord. We need her power for the marines, not against it, right? Um, I guess you could technically also throw Granny Neon on this list, because she doesn't have a devil fruit. Shaki, from what we know of, doesn't have a devil fruit. We've known Shaki a little longer, but there still hasn't been that many scenes with her in the story, so she could have a devil fruit. Uh, she's currently married to Rayleigh, and they live together on, uh, the Saba Odi Archipelago. There you go. And she runs her bar. Um, Next up are uh, two minks. We have Carrot and Wanda. They both do not have Devil Fruit powers, but they do have the capabilities of Sulong because they are minks. So I guess, honestly, technically speaking, you could really pick any female mink on this list. You know, it's just Carrot and Wanda are the ones that are the most prominent, and they are warriors. Uh, but any mink that goes into Sulong is insanely powerful, even a civilian. Okay, would be a lot stronger, like... Honestly speaking, like, if you were going to take any random civilian mink with Sulong versus, like, I would say Vivi, uh, then I would I would still put money on the Sulong mink, you know what I mean? Just have the ability to channel Electro kind of gives you a huge advantage there. Um, but we see Carrot and Wanda as the two most prominent members of the minks that are, are female that go into their Sulongs, and we fight we, they fight during uh, Wano against Pero Sparrow. That's another fight that I kind of really wish that Carrot and Wanda would have just defeated Pero Sparrow right there. Yeah, it was really cool that Nekamamushi showed up and kind of got the final hit, but it's like... Ah, I feel like Carrot and Wanda and Perospero was always already wounded from other fights he had earlier that that day in the battle. He lost an arm to Pedro. I feel like Carrot and Wanda should have been able to make um, you know, candy soup out out of Perospero pretty quickly. Um, but I get it, you know, he's really powerful also. He's one of the, you know, top-ranking members of Big Mom's crew. Okay, I understand, but like still, uh Karen and Wanda going into the Sulong form together against Perospero. One of the highlights and probably the last badass moment we're really going to get from Carrot and 
Wanda in the story. Uh, maybe we'll have an epilogue scene where we'll see them again. Uh, you know, but Carrot went back to become the Duchess of Zoe, so she's there, and Wanda's going to be probably one of her assistants, you know, to her, like an advisor to Carrot, because, you know, she's still fairly young. She doesn't know how to rule an entire nation. Uh, but I think they'll both be okay. It, it's just that we're probably not going to see a lot of more... I mean, maybe during the final war, they'll all show up again, and then we'll see it one more time, uh, but we have to wait for that. So, next up, we have Reiju, Vinsmoke. Um, this is kind of where we're getting into the categories of, like, okay, they don't have Devil Fruits, but they have some other crazy broken ability. In the case with the Minx, it's Sulong. In the case with Reiju, she doesn't have a Devil Fruit. It was actually erroneously printed in, I think, one of the issues of the One Piece magazine or one of the data books or an interview or something at one point where Reiju did have a Devil Fruit that was like some kind of butterfly fruit that allowed her to like absorb poison. Uh, that was not uh, that was not like an accurate statement or maybe Oda retconned it or something. Uh, all of the Vinsmoke siblings uh, do not have Devil Fruits. They are all just have their inherent abilities because of their modifications, uh, genetic modifications that Judge did, and alongside their raid suits, they're able to activate these abilities. So Reiju has uh, the power of Poison Pink. Um, she's able to be immune to poisons, so poisons don't really work on her. She uses poison to attack. Uh, there was, like, a bunch of the Big Mom pirates firing arrows at her. She basically made, like, this really cool, like, poison. Not even poison at that point. It's more like a caustic kind of acid that, like, melted all of the arrows and, like, you know, caused her to, like, be completely unharmed from the actual physical attacks. Um, and then she can also absorb poison, as we saw this when Luffy ate the poisonous stonefish in the hot, hot sea. Reiju was able to suck out the poison, and Luffy was fine. And uh, she seemed to, like, just like how Mr. Five could, like, eat explosions and be like, man, that gunpowder was really delicious, or that gunpowder sucked. You need to use more flavorful body or whatever. Just like how Mr. Five was able to eat explosions, uh, and Magellan is able to eat poison, uh, kind of in the same vein as Magellan. Reiju enjoys poison as well, uh, except I don't think she has the uh, the same issues with the, the bowel movements as, uh, as uh, Magellan did. Uh, yeah, but Reiju seems to, like, oh, that poison was very tasty, okay? So she actually enjoys to eat poison. So you know, all of the benefits of the Venom Venom fruit, I guess, without any any of the uh, negative after effects as uh, Magellan has to deal with. Uh, but yeah, so Reiju, pretty powerful, obviously, and also she's just beyond her ability of Poison Pink. Um, just the genetic modifications, her skin is hard as steel, uh, she has the uh, the boots, and also the uh, the raid suit just makes her even more powerful. She can fly and jump around and kick. Uh, very strong on her own there. So that's Reiju. Uh, next up is another character who hasn't showed up that much. I feel like she's probably going to have a devil fruit, but we do not know. And that's uh, Whitey Bay, who is a former member of the Whitebeard Pirates back during the time when the Whitebeard crew arrived at Wano. She was a full-on member, and now she runs her own crew, and she's an ally of Whitebeard. Okay, and so she shows up during the War of the Best. She has a really cool outfit. She's like the Ice Queen. Uh, she's like Elsa, you know, from Frozen. She has an icebreaker vessel. She's traveled to the most coldest regions of the One Piece world, maybe the Ice Continent. She's been there before. Uh, she fights with a sword, uh, but I feel like really strong pirate. She was on Whitebeard's crew. I feel like she probably has some kind of devil fruit. Honestly speaking, if she doesn't have a devil fruit, she would probably be the one that would be the most fitting to receive the Yuki Yuki no me. I mean, honestly, now that I'm thinking about it, that's kind of a no-brainer. Um, but, you know, I feel like she is going to show up again. Uh, she might even show up actually sooner rather than later because of the whole situation on Sphinx Island and uh, with Weevil being captured, maybe it's like Marco's going to call in a favor for Whitebeard's allies and then Whitey Bay will show up along with like, you know, uh, some of the other members like Andre or Apoida or uh, Eowan or Iowan, who is the walrus mink. Maybe they'll show up and like the Declavin brothers, and they'll they'll help out, uh, maybe try to rescue Weevil or something. I, I guess we'll see. Uh, next up is Miss Golden Week, another character that has a ability that's powerful, but not a Devil Fruit ability, and it's already been revealed to definitely not be a Devil Fruit power. Uh, Marion, or Miss Golden Week, who was a member of Baroque Works under Mr. Three Galdino, has the ability of uh, Colors Trap, where she can paint with her brush, and then if um, it, the particular color is either on the person's like clothing or on their skin, or even if she draws it on the ground and they're standing on it, various effects can uh, incur. For example, I remember red was bullseye red, so if she draws the color red on anything, uh, somebody is forced to attack that color, uh, like a bull is charging at red, which I don't think bulls are really susceptible to the color red. I think bulls are susceptible to any kind of movement, uh, whether it's red or not, but whatever. Uh, betrayal black is another one, where uh, as long as the person has the symbol on them, they'll betray their friends, kind of like opposite day, they'll do the exact opposite of what, um, 
their friends ask them to do. Uh, then she can also combine colors. I remember she combined sorrowful blue and, uh, oh, there was another color for green. Uh, she combined those two together and that made like friendship uh, blue green. And she used that on a pterodactyl to get it to fly them off of Little Garden because they were kind of trapped on Little Garden. Miss Valentine, Mr. Five, uh, and uh, uh, Miss Golden Week were trapped on the island after those events. So she used her colors trap on a pterodactyl and the pterodactyl became their friend and then it flew them off the island. Then a rainstorm came in and washed off the paint and they got knocked off. Like, honestly, like, okay, her abilities worked really well on Luffy because Luffy was already discussed to be very susceptible to hypnosis. If you go back in early One Piece, Luffy is very susceptible to any ability that affects his mind or suggestion. Uh, Django's hypnotism as well as Miss Golden Week's color trap really are kind of like Luffy's weaknesses. It really isn't a weakness that's been addressed in a long time, but he still, and, and it might not be an issue anymore because he has observation and conquerors now, so it probably wouldn't work in the same way, but early One Piece, Luffy could be susceptible to that but it's interesting if miss golden week used her colors trap ability on a character that is strong but doesn't have conquerors hockey because i feel like conquerors hockey would just override it but if you don't have conquerors and you paint it on you uh, it might work like who's a really strong character that we know for a fact does not have conquerors um, let's just, uh, how about Queen? Queen from, uh, the Big Mom, not Big Mom, uh, Beast Pirates. Uh, yeah, Queen, I don't think had Conquerors, no. If Miss Golden Week used, uh, Colors Trap on Queen, would it work? <laughs> like, would it work? You know, would Queen become, like, you know, fight for Miss Golden Week or whatever? Maybe. Possibly. I don't know. Um, but her most uh, most powerful ability is the rainbow color trap, which allows her to kind of paint all of the colors of the rainbow. And then everybody that the rainbow, everybody that the, sees the rainbow realizes their dreams. And it, it, it manifests in the way of their clothing changing. So Crocodile always wanted to be king of the pirates. So he sees the rainbow color trap in the sky. And he gets, like, this really cool pirate captain outfit and, like, a hat that has the Baroque work symbol. Like, you're the pirate king. And Crocodile's just like, what the hell is this? <laughs> you know, uh, Mr. One, Daz Bones, always wanted to be a superhero, which is a pun on his devil fruit ability, the Dice Dice fruits or the, the Fruit or the uh, Supa Supa Nomi. So the Supa Supa Nomi, so the Super Super Fruit. So he's a superhero. And so he gets, like, a really cool superhero outfit, and he's kind of happy. He's like, this is really cool. You know, like, he doesn't change his appearance, but he's like, I like this. This is really cool. You know, like, yeah. So that's a really powerful ability. And she used that ability on all the other members of Baroque Works. And they went off to live out their dreams and start a new spider cafe somewhere in the desert in some random islands. All right, so only a few more characters left, and I am almost certain that I am missing some prominent characters here, so feel free to go down below and comment on that. Uh, but next up, we have Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca, the uh, one of the greatest gladiators in the Corridia Coliseum. I mean, hey, she made it to the final round. There you go. Uh, it was also mentioned that Rebecca had this uh, fighting style where she wasn't really about, you know, like stabbing and bleeding out all of her opponents. It was more about her dodging and parrying and deflecting all of the other attacks so nobody could really ever hit her. Her style style of fighting was wearing very light armor uh, in the Colosseum and then just kind of dancing around and having people like tire themselves out and then she would like you know trip them up and push them into uh, the water because she was very much against violence only as like a last resort um I mean, she was fairly emotional during the battles and everything. Like, she cried quite a bit in that arc. But could you really blame her considering all the stuff that happened in her backstory? I feel like now, in a similar vein to uh, Vivi, now that, you know, Luffy liberated the island and her father is back and they've defeated Doflamingo and they took out Diamante and everything, I feel like Rebecca can now begin the healing process, you know, both physically because, you know, she really didn't want to fight in the Coliseum. Uh, so she doesn't have to worry about that anymore. But also just, you know, mentally mentally, emotionally, hopefully she has like a therapist on Dressrosa maybe because there was a lot of stuff to work through there uh, with her, her mother being killed and everything like that and then Doflamingo taking over everything and her being basically forced to, you know, fight in the gladiatorial arena. Uh, some, some issues there. But she's beginning the process of healing and I think, uh, you know, like she was taught how to fight by Kiros when he was the Tin Soldier. I'm actually not really sure 
if Rebecca would continue her uh, training in that. Because that was pretty much like she had to learn how to fight to survive in the country of Dressrosa under Doflamingo's thumb. Like, she had to become strong, okay, in her own way. Um, and so, I'm actually curious. I feel like with Vivi, Vivi might be thinking in the back of her mind, like, someday I might have to go back and join the Straw Hats and I need to make sure to keep my, like, um, my skills honed. With Rebecca, it, it might be a situation where it's like, she doesn't doesn't want to fight anymore. She doesn't want to pick up a sword. She doesn't want to fight in the arena. So she might have just put down her sword, maybe like framed it or something in her room is like, here's my helmet. Here's like the time I was a gladiator. Um, but I've moved on beyond that. I really don't want to fight anymore. It's not really in my nature. Uh, I would much rather just, you know, hang out with my dad who I forgot about for like, you know, 10 years or something. Um, but maybe not. Maybe she still wants to practice and maybe she would, that's a nice bonding activity for her and Kiros and be like, dad, I still want you to teach me, you know, how to fight. And Kiros is like, okay. And she, he begins to cry and she begins to cry and they're training in like the flower fields or something that, that could work too. I could see it kind of both ways with Rebecca, uh, whichever path she chooses from here on out. Then we have, um, Okay, uh, Dr. Kareha, who I almost forgot about on this list, so Dr. Kareha, very powerful, uh, of course, her strength is not all in, you know, physical power, although she can, like, we saw her during Drum Island, I mean, she was just picking up random stuff from the castle, like, here's a club, here's a morning star, here's a great sword, here's a claymore, she's, like, throwing it at, at, uh, Luffy and Sanji there, so she is physically powerful, and she also just pretty powerful kicks as well from what we saw there with, like, uh, anytime someone calls her an old lady, so, yeah. Uh, of course, her major uh, skills rely in, um, you know, medicine, okay? Because she's, like, the, probably the greatest doctor in the entire world right now. She's a youthful 141 years old. Um, and uh, I can't wait to see her. Like, I think she's definitely going to make an appearance later in the story. I mean, before the reunion with Chopper and everything, because, like, all the, you know, Straw Hats friends and families and, like, step-parents or whatever are going to show up at the end when their journey is over. Obviously, like, you know, Usopp's going to go back to Syrup Village and see Kaya. Nami's going to return to Kokoyashi to see Genzo and, and Nojiko and everybody there. Uh, so Kareha will show up at the very end. But I kind of want Kareha to um, reveal some more truths about her past uh, because there's a lot of theories right now. What if Kareha was the one that had the immortal surgery performed on her by a previous doctor? Because we know the previous user of the Op Op Fruit was a famous doctor. So maybe it was a colleague of Kareha. And, you know, the crazy thing, because Kareha is so youthful, 141 years old, um, that's... It could be a situation where this could have occurred well over a hundred years ago. You know what I mean? Like this could have occurred a hundred years ago where she might have known this previous doctor user of the op op fruit and might have gotten the power to be immortal, not immortal, but eternal youth there. Um, and so, or it could have just been because of the, uh, just her medical skills. You know what I mean? Just because she's the best doctor in the entire world. So she could just like brew up, like just stays in the perfect shape, the best kind of medicine to stay active and everything like that. She exercises, I'm sure, daily. Um, yeah, so that that's Kareha. Pretty powerful there. So anyway, that's everybody I wrote down on the list. Uh, all of the women that I thought of that did not have Devil Fruit powers that are fairly strong in the One Piece story or might have been strong in, you know, their younger years. So um, let me know what you think about this and if I forgot anybody, feel free to comment and like I said, I might make this into like a four-part series where we'll talk about, you know, the strong women in One Piece that have Devil Fruit powers and then, you know, the men that have Devil Fruit powers, men that don't have Devil Fruit powers. That would be a cool little series I think I could do. So anyway, yeah, with that being said, it's a long video already, but we're not done yet, ladies and gentlemen. Oh no! We still have Rhino Facts. Intro. All right. So, Rhino Facts. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the Indian Rhino. Uh, most people are probably familiar with the African White Rhino, and we've talked about that before. Uh, also, I'm going to remain the, the link to IRF, the uh, International Rhino Foundation, will be in the description below if you would like to go and check that out. And you can donate to the cause, you can adopt a rhino, all that really cool stuff. Um, but anyway, yes, today we're talking about the Indian Rhino. So, the Indian Rhino looks a little bit uh, distinct uh, from their uh, African counterparts. Uh, they do not have two horns as this rhino does right here they only have one horn and the horn of the indian rhino is significantly shorter than the rhino uh, of uh, like the white rhino of africa however that doesn't deter poachers at all they were st they're still poached uh actually maybe even more so than the african rhinos are uh for their horns for various kind of traditional medicines um 
and see just some data about them here. So their status right now as a, just the, cause they're subspecies, but their status as a, as a species is vulnerable. Um, about 50 million years ago is when they split off from Equidae. Equidae are the, um, it's the group that's the ancestors to all horses. So you can, you can kind of see that, you know, also zebras and stuff are part of Equidae. So the rhino uh, split off from them about 50 million years ago. Currently there's around 2,500 Indian rhinos uh, alive in the wild. About 2,100 of them live in India. India itself. Uh, the range where they live in India is kind of like northern India, Pakistan, through India all the way to um, uh, Nepal. I think there's also some isolated ones that live in like Myanmar. Um, let's see. Now, uh, some interesting stuff about them, how they bathe, I think is fascinating. Um, they have um, some more like, I guess, skin flaps would be the, get the best term to refer to these things as. Some kind of like, you know, skin flaps that kind of open. And when they go swimming and they go bathing in a river or a pond or something, they actually, the water gets into those flaps and kind of gets contained in there. So I imagine that also kind of helps them stay cool cool uh in, in on the hot days and stuff you know so you kind of like have like these little pockets filled with water to kind of cool them down um when they need to they can run and charge very fast up to 34 miles per hour once again like most animals 34 miles per hour over a very short amount of time they can't like sprint at 34 miles an hour for a very long period of time but still you know you make a rhinoceros mad and it's charging at you at 30 miles an hour i don't think it really needs to be running that far to be intimidating the males or the bulls will remain isolated for most of their days, unless it's, of course, mating season, in which case they will become very agitated and begin to fight with other males. Uh, the females will stay in groups with the, uh, the calves, obviously, until they grow up and go off on their own. Um... They don't really have any sort of natural predators except for human beings and poachers, obviously. But their natural predators that come close to it are kind of tigers. But even with tigers, like, it's possible there was one uh, event where there were four tigers together took down a uh, 20-year-old Indian rhinoceros on, like, a preserve. So... Tigers usually kind of leave them alone because uh, aside from the Asian elephant, rhinoceroses are the largest terrestrial land animal in that entire region of Asia. So, uh, yeah, you don't really want to mess with a rhino, even if you're like a big cat. Uh, but if you get a bunch of tigers together to kind of coordinate, then, yeah, you could drop a rhino. But so tigers sometimes, but mostly it's just humans that are the poachers. And in fact... This is gruesome, but I got to bring this up because such a big part of rhino facts of the, the big strife that they deal with in the wild, wild right now is poaching. OK, so I feel like I have to bring this up. So there are various methods of how they are poached. All right. Like exactly how it happens. And there are six most popular uh, ways that poachers will kill these rhinos, these poor creatures, and then just harvest their horns to be taken off for some illegal trade because some people get jollies out of having rhinos over their fireplaces or using them in medicines that has no actual, like, like it's not, it's, it's not some magic cure-all, okay? You're killing these poor creatures. So the most common method that rhinos are poached are um, shooting them, obvious, you know. The next one is using pits. Like, they would literally dig out a pit, like a pit trap, in the wild, throw some leaves over it, and then the rhino just falls in the pit. Electrocution, poisoning, spearing them, or literally using a noose to strangle them to death. No shit. All right, so um, once again, um, link to the IRF, International Rhino Foundation. They do a lot of help down below if you would like to go and, and donate to the rhinos. So um, yeah, that's uh, Rhino Facts for today. Hmm.